Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us about these simple, miraculous, and controversial words of our Lord Jesus recorded in John chapter 5, verse 8. Dr. McGee titled this message, When Jesus Visited the Hospital, and it's part of a series he called Tracing the Steps of Jesus in the Days of His Flesh. Now, we've got just a few minutes to share a letter from a fellow listener. So while you climb aboard the Bible bus, let's hear from Chris, who recently emailed to say, I wish I could tell you how long I've been blessed by your program. I remember as a very young boy riding with my father as he made deliveries, listening to Dr. McGee. Now my own children are grown and are Christians. I listen on my mobile app every day. Enclosed is a little money for some reupholstery on my seat. I know it's well-worn. Steve and Greg, keep reading the letters of how you are reaching people all around the world. It's such an encouragement. Your voices are as welcome to us as Dr. McGee's. Well, thanks for the encouragement, Chris, and it is a pleasure to hear from you. And thanks for supporting the Bible Bus as well. Now, if you'd like to know how you can join Chris and others listening who keep the Bible Bus rolling through your neighborhood and around the world, Just visit our website at ttb.org forward slash give or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Let's pray as we turn our hearts to God's word. Father in heaven, give us hearts of compassion and mercy for those who are sick and suffering. May your grace be upon them and may your word today bring more people into a saving relationship with your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Here's the Sunday sermon with Dr. J. Vernon McGee on Through the Bible. We had the privilege this summer on vacation of stopping up in Northern California in Scotia, where the great uh, lumber mill of the Pacific Lumber Mill is located, where they take these mighty redwood logs and they let you go in as a visitor and they do not begin by showing you the finished redwood lumber product. You go up and start with the logs. These great big logs are rolled in, and a redwood always has a very thick coat on it. And they take a mighty stream of water and steam, and it just peels that mighty redwood log as you would peel a banana. In fact, it looks to me like it does it a great deal easier. No difficulty at all. And then it comes out like a peeled banana, and then you follow it through as those mighty saws begin to attack that great log, and before long it's taken apart, before long there goes through strips of lumber, before long you see a two by four, you see a one by twelve, and you see some little narrow strips coming out. But actually, in order to understand it, you need to begin at the beginning and go all the way through to see the finished product. Our difficulty is, in personal work, that we do not take the center through the mill to see the different steps that are taken before our Lord could say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment rather than condemnation, into judgment but is passed from death to life. I propose to go back this morning to the very beginning, and I go to this incident of where our Lord entered Jerusalem. And he entered Jerusalem at a feast day, and since there is no agreement at all among Bible expositors as to the feast that's intended. It's impossible to know which it is, and it's actually not important. The important thing is, now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep, not market, but gate, 
This is the sheep gate of which Jeremiah, or rather Nehemiah, mentions that this was a gate that was repaired. It was, it, uh, I should say, is the gate that probably today corresponds to St. Stephen's gate. Actually, these things cannot be accurately determined, but this is the gate that the little animals were brought in, not only for market, but especially for sacrifice. This is the gate that these animals were brought in, the lambs that were to be offered as a sacrifice upon the altar. Now, our Lord comes in through this gate, and it's the only mention of the fact that he comes through this gate. But I personally believe, you do not have to accept this, for it's not scriptural, but it's merely an inference drawn from scripture. I believe that he never entered Jerusalem publicly until the time of the so-called triumphal entry, that he avoided the, these main entrances, and that each time he came in, he came in through the sheep gate in order that he might say by symbol what John the Baptist had said at the beginning of his ministry, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He entered in by the sheep gate, I think, on every occasion until the last. But whether that be true, I would not defend it. I would say we know that on this occasion he came in by the sheep gate, and that by the sheep gate there was a pool. Not just a small thing, it actually, the Greek word means something you can dive into. And if it's, it must have been the size of a young swimming pool. And here about this pool, and it's called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Now why was it called that? Again, I'm not sure. I believe that it was called that because it means, in the Hebrew, house of mercy. It could mean house of olives, but it seems better to say this was the house of mercy and it was because of what had taken place here. Also, someone, some generous person, had built some porticos there. Actually, they were shelters, and that is pro this is probably the first hospital that was ever built. It was a place where those that were lame, those that were sick, those that had infirmity could come and they could stay out from and under the, the weather, the, the hot beating sun or the rain or whatever it might be on the outside. So that this is the place that our Lord came and we're told that in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. I remember several years ago, before I actually came to the church at the open door, one Sunday afternoon of speaking up in the Preventorium, it's an Easter Sunday afternoon in Altadena, and the children put on a program before I spoke. One little fella, a very bright little fella, got up and gave from memory chapter 5 of John. He, he did it all. He took this entire chapter. And the very interesting thing is that he never missed a word except one, and it was this one right here. He said instead, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, he said, in these lay a great multitude of important folk. And that little fella, I thought about it a great deal, was probably right. They were important. They were so important that our Lord felt that he should go by there for the sake of one at least. And I want you to notice that when it says impotent folk, it really means sick people. This was a hospital. In these lay a great multitude of sick people. And then he begins to identify the types of trouble. There were blind folk there. There were those that halt. They, they were crippled. There were those that were withered, those that had had some form of paralysis, and they were waiting for the moving of the water. Now, that expression, that phrase, waiting for the moving of the water, and verse 4 
are not in our better manuscripts. And I, for one, do not believe that it should be in our text. I'll tell you why. This was put in here by a scribe to explain to us in the 20th century why these people were there. And the explanation, of course, is a superstitious explanation. They were waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now some scribe who was copying this, he said, Now the people at the church of the open door on that first Sunday in September 1960 will not understand why these people are there by that pool unless I put in this note. And I personally believe it should be left in the text with the explanation that you'll find today in a good Bible. That is a Bible with notes. It will make it very clear that this is not in our better text. I think it should remain, however, in the text with the explanation, for it tells us why they were there. They were waiting for the moving of the water. We talked about the woman of Samaria, and we started off with our interest in the bottom of that well. That was actually the very center of interest. It was the point of contact. But before we finished, we saw that that well, as far as our Lord was concerned, didn't amount to that, nor the water in it. Today we come to another pool, and it's very important here at the beginning. By the time we finish this morning, this pool won't be worth that. If you think there was any merit in that pool that was supernatural, you're just dead wrong. There's no merit in that pool at all, and our Lord made it clear there's no merit in the pool. Now somebody's going to come to me and say, now wait just a minute, Dr. McGee. Here is a great company of of sick people about that pool, and they're waiting for the moving of the water. It did move at times, and people went into it, and people must have come out cured, or the others would have been removed. Well, I must say that I have to face that issue, and I'm willing to face it and say this. There were some people that got cured. Because today, a good doctor will tell you that a lot of people are not sick except in their head, that they are sick psychologically. There are a great many people who enjoy bad health. Have you ever noticed that the number of people that get sick Saturday night or Sunday morning? I've been in the ministry now for a long time, and it's amazing how sick you can get on Saturday night or Sunday morning. But Monday morning, all over and you say, well, do not you think those people are sincere? I do. They're sincere. May I say to you that a great many people at this pool had been healed. But there's nothing supernatural there. When the tornado several years ago went through Waco, Texas, and absolutely just plowed down through the center of the town and removed large brick buildings, As it entered the town, it came in through a subdivision in which there were quite a few Mexican folk were living, and a young Mexican girl who had been in a wheelchair, I believe it was around a dozen years, probably 15 years, just as a little thing, she had had uh, a polio, or at least they thought she had. She'd never been able to walk, and she'd been in a wheelchair all these years. She sat in the doorway watching that tornado enter the town. Have you ever seen a Texas tornado? Well, I haven't. It's like everything in Texas. It's big and very impressive. That uh, tornado struck. It blew the house away. And after it had passed through, people were milling around outside. And somebody said to this girl, you are walking. She had gotten up out of the wheelchair and was walking. 
I'm told that she has never returned to that wheelchair. Now, whatever the mental block was, the tornado removed it. And as far as I can find out, that tornado has never qualified as a faith healer, but he did a very good job. He did a, he did a most excellent job, by the way. In fact, that was the one good part of the tornado. A girl that was in a wheelchair, and don't say that she was not sick, she was sick. She got up and walked. Now, there were people that came to this pool, had faith and confidence in it, and they were not maybe too sick, and they got down in the pool, and they came up, and they were healed. But don't attach anything supernatural to that pool, for there was nothing supernatural to it at all. May I say that there are several places now in this world that we are hearing that folk go there that are crippled. There is a place in France where they've got crutches hanging all over the place where people have come and been healed. You want to say to me this morning that you don't believe anybody got healed? You're wrong. The folk got he have gotten healed there. But then do you want to say to me, then, Dr. McGee, you believe then there's something supernatural there? Not at all. If you had the same faith, you could get in your bathtub and get the same result. But you don't believe in the water in the bathtub. But there are some that believe in that, and since there is some sort of a mental block, and it's removed by this sort of thing, and they're enabled to walk. The interesting thing is that multitudes leave there just like they were when they came. And the reason is their disease is not in their head. It's real. It's in reality. Now, it's not to say the other disease is not real. It is real, but it's mental. Now, this pool was a place that had become a hospital. Multitudes of people were there. How many? I do not know. But I have a notion that there were a great company of folk that were there, and I must pause to say this, only one man got healed. I would like for somebody to answer for me, because I do not seem to be as versed in these matters as some folk today who write me, especially when I mention it on the radio. If today healing is in the atonement, we have a perfect right to claim it. And we have a perfect right to say to God, if I'm sick, he, has, he must heal me. And they even order him today to do the healing. What about that other crowd that were there? If they had a right to be healed, our Lord was very unkind. fact of the matter is, I think he was cruel, if that be true. If he did not, say to the others, why don't you claim your healing? I have it here for you. The record says that he did not say that. Apparently. It was not there for them. There was one man there that would believe. That's the man that he's come to. Would he have healed the others? Yes. They had turned to him. Again, I find no one in the record saying, I believe also, Lord, that you can do this. Not one of them. I move on. I want to introduce you now to this man that we've already mentioned. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. That's a long time to be sick, is it not? I do not know this, but I believe that this man was the worst case that was there. I do not think he'd been here thirty-eight years, but he'd had this disease thirty-eight years. He'd apparently been here a long time. So long that he's able to say, others go down ahead of me. He was the worst case. Everybody else could get ahead of him. And he's in a desperate condition. A certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. Now, will you notice this? When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, 
he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Now, the word will there has in it the thought, Do you really desire to be made whole? Why did our Lord say that to that man? It's almost like mocking him. Here is a man that's been sick for 38 years, so helpless and hopeless that at this pool he cannot get down into it. My friend, he's in an, he's in an awful condition physically. 38 years he's been in that condition. How long he'd been at that pool, I don't know. He'd been there a long time. Our Lord says to him, Do you really desire to be made whole? Why did our Lord say that to him? It sounds like he's mocking him. Why would he say to the man, Do you really want to be made whole? I think the reason our Lord did was this. And can you see the picture? Here is a pool. Wonderful things have happened at that pool. Around that pool are all kinds of sick folk. All of them are looking one direction, watching for the moving of the water. They're all watching. Because the first one that gets down will be healed, maybe. And I might be the first one, and so they are watching for the moving of the water. Now, there is a pool there that we're told that in old days would rise and fall as much as three feet at intervals. It would go down, and then all of a sudden gurgle, and the water would come rushing in, and it would rise about three feet. Evidently, that's what it was, and they were watching. They're all watching, and our Lord walks up, and nobody's... Nobody's looking at him. They have no faith in him, but they have faith in that pool. They're all watching the pool. What a picture of today. We, you and I are living in a city that majors in pools where there's a lot of agitation. And some of them really stirred up. Somebody says, you know, I... I'm looking for an experience. There's a man that used to sit right out in front of me. He's now gone home to be at the Lord, and he's with the Lord. He said, Dr. McGee, I was brought up in a church where you had to have an experience. I have never had an experience. I says, have you trusted Christ? He said, oh, yes, I've trusted him. I says, is he your Savior? Oh, yes, he's my Savior. But he says, I'm never satisfied. I want an experience. Poor fella sat out there for years, looking at the pool, hoping someday in here. He never missed a service. He heard every speaker. He would heard him here for 25 years. In the past 25 years, every great preacher of America has stood in this pulpit. And the, he watched the pool. Oh, if I could only see it agitate and stir, and I could get in it and something would happen to me. My brother, this morning, if you're looking at a pool, you're looking at the wrong place. A lot of pools in Southern California. Oh, if something could only happen to me. A lot of people today, they go here, they go yon, they go everywhere. They, they investigate all the watering spots. There are folk in Southern California, if they hear there's been a tent put up in the other side, Long Beach, and something happened there to somebody, they'll be there tonight. It might happen to me. And they're running around looking at poo, just looking at poo. Waiting for the moving of the water. Something to happen. Oh, my friend, this morning, if you are one of those folks, may I say it this morning? May I say it with a great deal of anxiety? For God's sake, get your eyes off the pool.
You're looking at the wrong place. And our Lord said to this man, Do you sincerely desire to be made whole? Why did he say it? He said it to get that man's eyes off the pool. Nobody else looked up, only that man. Why, don't you see? He's watching the pool, and the Lord Jesus comes up, and he says to him, Say, you, do you sincerely desire to be made whole? What would a man do in a case like that? Do I sincerely desire to be made whole? Man, I've been here all these years. I've been sick 38 years. Do I sincerely desire to be made whole? But he's got his eyes off the pool for a moment. And you know what? He says now, it's not that he has faith yet in the Lord Jesus. He does not. Do you notice what he says to our Lord? He says to him, I have no man when the water's troubled to put me in the pool. But while I'm coming, another step is down before me. What frustration. You talk about my beloved not only being physically sick, this man must have been mentally sick. What frustration to have been there. Suppose you've waited six months. You say, well, I'm right here at the edge the next time I go in. And then there begins the disturbance of the water. It begins to come back up, and as it starts coming back up, splash, somebody beat him. Now he's got to wait six more months. That's frustration for you, my friend. How many folk are frustrated today? Because of that, they've been looking, they've been looking to some pool, or maybe looking to some man. As a man who sits in the balcony, I won't even look up there now. He said to me, he says, you know, McGee, I looked for several years at a preacher, and I almost became a skeptic. But he says, finally, I got my eyes off of him and got him on Christ. And when I did, Everything worked out. Uh, where are you looking today? What are you looking at? Watching pools today? Looking to man today? Oh, what frustration! What awful frustration! What disappointment! What anxiety of soul! I have no man to put me in the pool, and you ask me, do I sincerely want to be healed? Would you put me in the pool? He's got his eyes on Jesus for the first time. Would you put me in the pool? And my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ has no notion of putting that man in the pool or putting you in one either. If you think this morning that you've got to have some great experience, are you looking to this organization or that man or to this thing today? May I say to you, get your eyes off of those things. Our Lord will not accept that kind of looking. Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved, for I am God. Spurgeon heard that one morning, snow on the ground, and Spurgeon said, I looked, and I was saved. You have to look to him. Now our Lord's prepared to do something for him. Will you notice now? Somebody gets down before me. Nobody to put me in the pool. Somebody before me. Would you do something for me? Would you put me in the pool? Our Lord dealt with this man in a most unusual fashion. Everything that he said is very concise. Every term he uses is an incisive term. Wilt thou be made whole? Now he says to him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. You see what he's asking him to do? No longer do you go down in the pool, but you're coming up, brother. You go in a different direction. This happens to be a freeway you're on. And you've been trying to get on the freeway going the wrong direction. You get on the freeway going the other direction. Rise. And he tells this man to do what he cannot physically do. Rise. I've been this way 38 years, and you tell me to rise. But he gets up. May I say to you, he has now looked away from a pool and he's looked to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. And he rises. Take up thy bed. The old Scotch commentator said, make no arrangement for a relapse. Don't try to keep your place here at the pool. 
you won't be needing it from here on. When the Lord healed, he did a good job, my friend. This man was told, rise, take up your bed, and then to do the thing that you have not been able to do, walk. I want you to start living for God. It doesn't end by just rising. Now you're to walk. The man walks away. Nobody else there. That, you know, disturbed me for years. Why didn't somebody else there say, Lord, don't you see me? Won't you help me? I know why now. They are all so intent on that pool, not one of them would miss his place. They believed the pool could do it. They did not believe this one at all. And though this has happened, they are not watching it. It's not impressive to them because they are watching a pool. And multitudes today are not being saved because of the fact they're watching a pool. They're watching for a movement. They're watching for agitation. They want something to happen before they do something. Our Lord said to this man, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately, not in 30 minutes, not in five minutes, not in two minutes, not in one minute, immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I do not have time this morning to enter in now to the controversy that ensued. You would think that the religious rulers, when they saw that man walking, would say to him, Hallelujah, brother, you're healed. They didn't. They said, Do you know you're carrying your bed on the Sabbath day? Now, I say this, and I say it kindly. We fundamentalists always say that. Somebody gets saved. A couple got saved here the other day, came into my office crying because somebody told them if they didn't start doing something and quit doing something else, they're not saved. Why are you carrying your bed on the Sabbath day? My friend, why don't you rejoice that somebody gets saved? Why not rejoice? that somebody gets saved. Why didn't they rejoice that this man is now able to walk and he hadn't been able to walk before? But they raised the argument, and you know, this man didn't know at that time who it was. Isn't that interesting? But he knew this. It was not the pool. He said, I met a man. Don't know him too well. It was the man that did it, not the pool. Our Lord's not through with any man that will come that far with him. He met him in the temple. You see, this man's very religious. He went to the temple for cleansing. Our Lord knew he'd be there and met him there. And our Lord said, now look here. The thing that made you as you are is sin. Don't sin anymore. You've met me and I've healed you. Don't sin anymore. The man said then to the rulers, you know... It's Jesus that did this. Now they let the man alone. They come to Jesus. How is it that you're doing this on the Sabbath day? He says, if you really want to know, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. We're honestly not concerned about a Sabbath day. We're not concerned about incidentals. He'd already claimed to be master of the Sabbath day. What he's saying here is this. When we rested back yonder in the Old Testament, after we created man, man got down in the ditch, and we've even said, when your ox gets in the ditch, you're to get him out. And we've been busy thousands of years getting the oxen out of the ditch. My man's in the ditch, and we're getting him out of the ditch. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. What he said was, in the Greek, it's quite interesting, he said, my own particular, peculiar father. He's my father, as he's not your father. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is related to the Father in the Trinity in a unique way. 
He is the eternal father. Now, you can't have an eternal father without an eternal son. And if you have an eternal father, an eternal son, you never have a day or a moment when there was any begetting done. It was eternally that way. That was the relationship out of eternity. And that's what he's saying. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now, unfortunately today, the Unitarians don't get this, and some of them seem to be intelligent. A lot of liberals quite don't, under, don't get this today. But I want to tell you, the religious rulers in that day did not miss the point. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. He's made himself equal with God. Now he's not through. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I have something else to say to you. I have three things to say to you. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. There is a, an axiom in geometry, things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. And this is mathematical, my brother. What God does, I do. I am God. And that man is walking for just one reason. I'm God, and I've forgiven him. I talked to him about his sin. The first thing. The second thing he says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. The second thing, and this is his tremendous claim, he says, I not only do what God does, but I am going to raise the dead. He says, as, he, as you move on, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming and now is, in the which they that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And there's not a person that will ever come back from the dead that he will not be the one who raises. He's God. He says, I raise the dead. Second. Tremendous claim. The third tremendous claim. For the Father judgeth no man, but he committed all judgment unto the Son. He says, look, God the Father is not going to judge you. I am. Every person, now this even includes saved, will have to appear before Jesus Christ. Now the saved will not appear there relative to whether they are saved or not. They appear there relative to rewards and their place in heaven. But you've got to appear before him. The lost will have to appear before him. God says, I take no unfair advantage of any man. That nice upstanding man in Pasadena says, I don't need Jesus Christ. I'll stand on my own record. The Lord God says, my friend, if you came before me, you couldn't stand there a moment but I've committed all judgment to my son. He took upon himself humanity. You will someday have to stand before him. And when you stand before him, the question is not how good you were in your community, but you stand in my presence compared to a holy God, and you come short, and you've fallen short of the glory of God. And the one with nail-pierced hands will judge you, the one who died for you. And the question will not be how good you are because you were told you were a sinner. And because you were a sinner, he died for you. And this one with nail-pierced hands will have to ask you, Why did you reject me? That's the only question. On the basis of this threefold claim, because he went yonder through the sheep gate, stopped and just one man, that poor man, 38 years crippled, would you be made whole? Do you sincerely want to be made whole? Yes, of course I do. I have no man. Would you? I won't put you in the pool, but rise. And I do it. Because what God does, I do. Because I raise the dead. Not only a crippled man, I raise the dead. And I judge all men. And because of that, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death and the life. My friend, he's already been by the sheep gate. He was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's been there. But he still comes by. And there are a lot of sick men today. There are a lot of sick people today. Not physically, but spiritually sick. Out of touch with God. He still says, do you really desire to be made well? A lot of people say, well, I, I'm going to look at the pool. Won't do you any good. You may get a little psychological stimulus. That's all. That's all. But he says now, will you listen to him? Do you hear him this morning? Are you still looking at a fool? Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, the word of the one who's God, the word of the one that's going to judge man, the word of the one that will raise the dead, he says to you today. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath right now. Everlasting life, if you trust him. And you will not come into judgment, but you're passed from death to life. Do you hear him? You want to look up from the pool today and look to him. Will you hear his word? You're not listening to a man now. You're not listening to an invitation that's coming from some well-wisher some do-gooder. You're not listening to the invitation this morning of somebody that, well, they'd like to help you, but they're not sure. You're listening this morning to the invitation that comes from God, from the one who died on the cross for you, and someday he'll raise you from the dead. If you're his, you'll be brought into his presence someday. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. But my friend, if you're not in that group, you're not through with him. The Father hath committed all judgment to the Son, and you have to stand before the man that died for you. I tell you, your good works, that won't look very impressive. When you've turned your back on the man that died for you, that you might be saved. Are you hearing him today? Maybe not in an audible voice, but through the teaching of his word. Is he changing your heart and mind? Well, if you'd like to know more about the invitation Dr. McGee spoke of, visit our website at ttb.org and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There we've gathered several free resources for you to read and listen to, or call 1-800-65-BIBLE and we'll be happy to put a few of these resources in the mail to you. The sermon that you heard today was called When Jesus Visited the Hospital, and it's available on an individual CD or as part of our Tracing the Steps of Jesus in the Days of His Flesh audio series. To order the series on audio or MP3 disc or to check out the many Bible study resources we offer, visit us at ttb.org or call and ask for a catalog at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now this week on the daily broadcast of Through the Bible, we'll continue with Dr. McGee's compelling study through the Gospel of John. As we go, I pray that God blesses and wraps you in His grace, mercy, and peace until we meet again. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.